If you want senior developer skills and you're not building projects outside of work, then you're missing an incredibly effective way to accelerate your growth. My name's Aaron Bourne and I've been coding for over a decade and a half and I've built countless projects, both leading teams and building solo. And some of those builds you can find right here on YouTube. In this video, I share with you the strategy that I use to design and deliver a build using Java and Spring Boot all with the goal of refining skills and gaining experience. There's a lot to cover in this video, so I've compiled everything into a handy PDF that you can download for free. There is a link in the description below. So let's now take a look at this strategy, and this strategy comes in six steps. The first one is goal. The second one is requirements. Third, we have constraints. Then we have architecture. Fifth, we have code. And finally, we have review. Let's get started with step one, and that's goal. This step is pretty simple, but it is crucial. You're going to answer two questions. The first one is, what am I going to build? And the second one is, why am I going to build it? Actually building something gives you a ton of experience and highlights gaps in your knowledge that you wouldn't have known about before. So they're really valuable. But if you can't answer these two questions, you could end up spending far more time on the build than what you actually need to. So let's start by exploring that first question. What am I going to build? It could be a to-do list app, it could be a chat app, it could be any number of different things. But the key here is that the idea is clear enough in your mind that you could explain it to somebody else. And you're excited about building it, because that's really the secret that will keep you motivated throughout the build. With this answer, the next question is, why am I going to build it? Now your immediate answer might be, because it's a cool idea. And I get it, and it's a great start. But you need to think about some questions after that. So is it to learn a specific tool, technique or technology? Is it for your portfolio when you go searching for enterprise level jobs? Or is it just to see if you can build it and to get it working by any means possible? After all, an app that you build to show off your professional coding skills is going to look quite a bit different from one that you just throw together to see if it works. So be clear about your goals up front so you can make sure that any time that you invest goes right towards meeting those goals. So now that you have a rough idea of what you're going to build and why you're going to build it, we can get a bit more specific by writing some requirements. Now you have some options here. So if your goal is to show off your business analyst skills to those who value technical documentation, there are ISO standards for that. So that's where I'd recommend that you start. For everybody else, I'd recommend writing some user stories. There are plenty of resources out there on how to write user stories. So we won't go into much detail here. I would say that yours don't need to be perfect, but they do need to do two things well. So the first thing that they should do is describe the feature that you are to build clearly so that you in a week's time or somebody else can read it and have an idea in their mind as to what you're going to build. The second thing is ideally your user story should have acceptance criteria so that you know when you are done. These are simple statements of facts, which can either be true or false. And when they are all complete, when they are all true, then you know that your user story is complete. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have an example of a user story describing the ability to log in and out of a chat application. Is this the best user story in the world? No. Is it a typical user story that you may throw together? Yes. So we'll go through it now. As a chat app user, I want to log in and out of the app securely so that my messages and personal details are kept private. So from this, we know who the user is, what they want to do, why they want to do that, and it gives us a bit of context. So in addition to this, we can also add some acceptance criteria. Here are some examples. So a user can log in securely. That can either be true or false. A user can log out securely. Same thing there. A user's credentials are stored securely. And at the bottom here in orange, we have an example of a non-functional requirement. Let's say it was one of your goals to build an app that can be used by a thousand plus users simultaneously. Adding a non-functional requirement is a good way to capture that in our user story and acceptance criteria. So you've nailed down exactly what you're going to build, but chances are you don't have unlimited time and unlimited budget. So let's take a moment to consider the constraints of our build. So let's start with the big three, and that's going to be time, resources, and scope. So time is an obvious one. That's how long your build is going to take. Scope is going to be how many user stories you're completing, how many requirements you are implementing. Resources is slightly less obvious. This is how many devs are working on the project. This might just be you. This might be how much computing power you have at your disposal, how much RAM you have, for example. And it might be if you have any budget for third party services like cloud computing services, for example. So let's take a moment to consider your constraints and how they're going to influence each other. If you want to increase your scope, but you have fixed resources, that's going to take more time. So if you want your build to be quicker, then you better reduce the scope 
or find out some way of increasing the resources such that you can deliver faster. So you might be asking, what if I want to deliver a ton of features, I don't want it to take longer and I have fixed resources? Well, the model that we see here is called the Iron Triangle of Project Management. And there is another variable that we can play with, and that's quality. Remember earlier when we were deciding on our goals? If one of your goals was to deliver by any means necessary, then it may be reasonable for you to drop the quality of your build in order to deliver more features or to deliver your build faster. Fair warning though is dropping the quality of your build isn't going to impress code reviewers, but it might get your build done in record time, so only you can make that call, it is your project after all. So how about it? Now is the time to ask some questions about your constraints. So when do you actually need this build done by? Are you coding by yourself or can you bring in another developer, a buddy, in order to increase the resources on the build? Do you have any money, any budget available for cloud computing services? And how powerful is the machine that you're building on? If you have very limited RAM, then designing a massive microservices system probably isn't the way to go because you won't be able to run it locally. And of course, this isn't an exhaustive list, so do consider any other constraints that you have for your build. Now is the time to do it. So this bit is a lot of fun. Next up, we have architecture. When you're starting out, I'd recommend a single Spring Boot application in a monolithic architecture, just like this. Now, it may look simple, but there are still loads of decisions to be made. So just a handful of those questions might be, how are you going to persist data? Are you going to use a database? Is it going to be a relational database or a NoSQL database? Which one are you actually going to use? Are you going to need any secondary storage? Maybe a search index or maybe a cache. You may have a single Spring Boot app and a monolithic architecture, but you still have lots of decisions to make and lots of flexibility at your disposal. As for your front end, it might be that your Spring Boot app uses Timeleaf in order to render HTML pages. Maybe it exposes a REST API or a GraphQL API or any other type of different API for a single page application. Now, I would typically build a single page application, a React front end that interacts with the Spring Boot back end via a REST API. But this is your build, so you pick the one that's best for you. Again, there are tons of resources out there on how to build using the various different architectures, so I won't go into much detail about them now. However, here is some guidance. As we've already touched on, I'd recommend starting with a single application in a monolithic architecture. But over time, I'd recommend introducing new services, considering how you want them to interact, synchronously or asynchronously. This is a great time to try out event-driven architectures, CQRS or event sourcing, for example, while you still have just a handful of services because the more services that you add, the more you move towards a microservices architecture, the more overhead that you'll have to deal with. So there's never been a cheaper time than to try out these new approaches than right now. Of course, if you'd rather have me guide you through these more complex builds, there is a link in the description below. So at the end of this stage, you may have a back of the napkin idea of what your architecture is going to look like, or you may have a more formal UML diagram. So what next? This bit doesn't need a lot of introduction. This is where you actually code the thing that you've designed but there are some things to bear in mind. If the goal of your build is to get something working by any means necessary, you already have everything that you need, have fun. However, if you're looking to impress somebody so that they may hire you, assuming that they haven't told you exactly what they're looking for, then you have an additional challenge on your hands. So let's just touch on code style. Now I'd recommend picking a style and sticking with it, being consistent. And there are already some well-established styles out there. You may want to use the IntelliJ default style, or you may want to use the Google Java style, for example. You may also want to consider using a tool like CheckStyle in order to make sure that the style of the code that you're writing is actually the style of the code as set by the style guidelines. So when it comes to code smells and bugs, there are some tools that you can use. You may want to use SonarCube, SpotBugs, or maybe PMD. You can use one of these tools or you can use a combination of them. The gist of these tools is that they're going to take a look at your code and then they're going to tell you what they think of it based on the rules that they've been programmed with. And in this way, they're able to identify code smells and potential bugs. So let's now talk about whether or not you should write clean code, because there are some developers on the internet that say don't write clean code. Ultimately, it's up to you. After all, I am just another developer on the internet. But if it were me, I would be writing clean code, especially if I'm writing code for a portfolio that I'm going to show somebody in order to try and impress them. So here's my thought process behind this. Let's say I'm your code reviewer. Regardless of how I feel about clean code, if I'm looking at your code and I can see that you correctly understood and applied rules in order for the code to look a certain way, 
That means that you can also do the same with any rules that I come up with. And in a hiring situation, for example, that's exactly what I would be looking for. But again, how you write your code for your build is entirely up to you. But the one strong recommendation that I would make is that you should be consistent because consistency really is key. So let's say you're nearing the end of your build. You've built your project, you've got it running. Maybe you've even written some tests for it. Are you done? Not quite. So at this point of your build, you have accomplished a lot, but you also know where all of the bodies are buried. So now is a good time to take a look at what you've built and start asking some questions. Asking these questions is important as it will allow you to get the very most out of the time that you've invested in the build. So here are some questions I'd recommend that you ask about your build. What went well in the build? What went less well in the build? Which bits are hacky? Why are they hacky? How could I improve them? And a big one is if I were to build this again, what new tool, technique or technology would I want to try out? Asking these questions will help you consolidate what you've learned on this build and help you tee up the next. So always end with a few questions. Although realistically, you'll be asking questions throughout the build. To learn why this is so important, check out this video right here.